Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us. Uh, my name is uh, Francesco Pagliarello uh, with Viavi Solutions Sales. I want to thank you for joining our call today on Tetra testing requirement and best practice. We have a lot to share with you, but before we begin, this webinar is being recorded and it will be available for you to review or share with your teams in approximately 20 or 48 hours. We will send you an email to we will send an email to all the attendees with a link with the recorded version. All lines are on mute, but we are monitoring the chat and we'll answer questions at the end of the webinar or reach out to you individually to assure that you get the answer you seek. The question will be anonymous. And now I would like to turn it over to our speaker <coughs> today, Barry Hack. Barry. Thank you. Thank you, Francesco. And uh Good morning, maybe good afternoon for some of you, and um, good evening. I know there's others joining from uh, Asia as well. So uh, this is, I think, uh, seminar number four in our series. Um, it's a new month. It's a new financial year for Viavi, so it's a fresh start for everyone. And today we're going to be talking about uh, Tetra testing and best practices. So I say, my name is Barry Hack. I'm a solution engineer for Viavi uh, EMEA region. Um, I've put up the the other, shall we say, specialists around the world. Um, so anyone outside of the region can contact those guys. Um, but please, if you're an EMEA, you come through to um, Francesco, who, who did the announcement earlier, Hamish, if it's Europe North, um, or myself for technical um, questions. And I apologize if it jumps back to um, not full screen. I've, I've had this all the way through and I still haven't worked out. It's called technology issues. Uh, okay, so just, just a very quick introduction to the company, uh, Viavi. Started in uh, 1923 as part of Wandel and Goldman. Um, migrated through um, JDSU uh, and then rebranded as Viavi. And along the way, they've picked up some other businesses. Um, including importantly in 2018, um, the, the Avcom and wireless businesses that were um, part of the Cobham um, group uh, in the UK. Focusing just on the radio test set side, so this is, this is um, my history as well as many of my colleagues. Um, I started life with Marconi Instruments, uh, which then became IFR, part of IFR, which then became part of Aeroflex, then part of Cobham, and then into Viavi. And uh, along the way as well, we picked up companies like Wiltec in Germany, um, and they had very good testers. Um, and then um, Celerity Systems in California, who were doing more broadband capability, which was, which was more military, shall we say, orientated. Okay. Viavi itself as a, as a, as a um, large company, um, multi-billion dollar company, um, I think we're at about 4,000 employees now. Um, we like to be number one in our markets. So we're a very close number two. So um, in our segments of, of test and measurement, wireless and avionics, we are number one. Um, but interestingly, Viavi is also um, involved in optical capabilities. So um, we produce most of the um, anti-counterfeiting ink, shall we say, for um, most of the world's banknotes and, and security seals on things like your Xbox. Um, but also optical capability on phones. So if you see um, modern phones that may have 3D cameras or 3D facial recognition, a lot of that optical um, filtering and lenses will come from Viavi. Okay, so we're not we're not just radio test sets. Today um, I'm going to talk about Tetra. Uh, I'm going to focus on the 3920B because it has most capability of the three three units. But I will also touch on 8800 and 3550. Um, we'll talk about manual testing of radios. And by radios, I mean portables and mobiles as well as base stations. And then I'll be um, going through some of the um, automatic test capability as well. And maybe uh, the benefits of that for the customers. Okay, saving time, de-skilling the process, repeatability and cost saving. 
So why is it essential to use a modern radio test set? So uh, just a little picture there of some Tetra measurements running. Um, you know, in analog and digital systems, we want to check the frequency of the radio is correct. You don't want to be off channel. Um, if you are, you may have problems um, between the transmit and receive link, um, or you may be causing interference to other users in neighboring channels or neighboring systems. And I apologize why it jumps back. Uh, we want to measure power. In an analog, typically um, AM and FM systems, your, your power is um, easily defined. Uh, you have an AM envelope or you have a constant power if it's FM, for example. Of course, you could have pulse signals, radar, for example. But in digital, a um, lot of the systems, um, the power is, um, shall we say, non-linear over time. Uh, it is moving with in sympathy with the modulation in some way. Um, you'll also have um, most of these systems now you have multiple time slots. So you could have, for example, DMI, you could have two users on a channel, Tetra four users. Um, and even if we jump back to, to good old GSM, there was eight users on a channel. So measuring your actual channel power is important um, rather than all of the power of all of the time slots. And again, with an analog meter, it would not be able to handle this very well because it would probably be doing some sort of averaging over time. Um, so your power would read too low or it'll be doing a peak measurement. Um, and in that case, your power read could potentially could read too high because uh, you'll see with Tetra that the power actually goes over, a, shall we say, a magnitude of one. And analog, we'd look at modulation. So we'd look at maybe um, the AM or FM performance and um, we could look at the um, FM deviation or the AM depth, for example. Um, very different in digital. We have um, different measurements, for example, error vector magnitude. And then in both cases, again, we need to look at the receiver as well, and we look at sensitivity. So an analog would maybe measure SINAD or, or SNR, for example. Um, but in digital systems, typically we're measuring um, the error in a digital bit stream, so the um, bit error rate. Some other things we'll measure in digital. Um, I've already mentioned the, the modulation um, error as an error vector magnitude. For Tetra, we measure both the peak value and the RMS value. They are both specified. Um, the burst timing, so we need to make sure that we are um, transmitting at the right time um, for our time slot, so we're not interfering with the other users on our channel. And we also have to measure the um, residual carrier or um, magnitude error. So residual carrier, is a measurement of how much, shall we say, local oscillator breakthrough has gone onto the output signal, or, or how much of the unmodulated signal has broken through the modulator uh, and got transmitted. And then uh, magnitude error might be where you might expect the uh, amplitude to be at a certain value. Uh, for example, um, on DMR systems, it would be fixed. On Tetra, it's not. Um, but you'd be looking to see how, how the power is deviating from the nominal um, ideal situation. So there's a lot of extra measurements we need to do in the digital system and the analog test sets cannot handle uh, most of these. Um, importantly, the digital test sets do handle the analog measurements. So you, you obviously can still do analog um, testing as well. So that's a little bit about what you need to do. And now we've just got one, one single poll question we want to give you um, and ask you what what you think are your priorities. So over to um, Jack and Francesco for a moment. Yes, we are getting uh, some answer. We are around 50% of the borders. We take a little bit, some minutes. We give you some additional minutes. Please provide your uh, answer. One more minute and then we close the, the poll.
Ok. Ok, we have uh, the result of the poll, Barry. We have 83% mm -hmm. the auto qu uh, quality, 76% the connectivity, and then 50% the safety feature, and then uh, the other two are user experience and uh, build quality. Okay, that's, that's good. That's useful information for us. Um for what we're doing now and what we'll be doing in the future. So thank thank you everyone for that. Um, hopefully you can now see my presentation again. Is that working okay, Francesco? Uh, yes, we are working. Perfect. We see the Tetra physical layer. We can, I can see it. Fantastic. Thank you. So just just a, a couple a couple of slides on um, um, the technology um, before we break into the um, actual testing. So uh, Tetra, Tetra is a system we call um, Pi by 4 Differential QPSK, um, which I'll explain in a little bit more detail in a moment. Um, each channel, which is a 25 kilohertz channel, has four time slots. So basically we, we digitize, apologies again, we digitize the, um, the voice or, or, or we take the data that you want to transmit and um, we basically compress that so we can transmit it in a, in a quarter of the, the channel time, shall we say. So you can have four users all working on the same frequency channel. Um, it, it, is a, it can be a full duplex system, so you have up and down transmit and receive channels, um, and you have a, a corresponding time slot in the other side of the radio link. Um, we're transmitting two data bits per symbol. That's not, you know, for most people, that doesn't really matter. We don't we don't need to look at that in that detail. Um, but what's interesting is if you think of four time slots or four users in 25 kilohertz of bandwidth, your effective bandwidth use is six and a quarter kilohertz, 6.25 kilohertz. Okay, so if you assumed you were using a channel all the time, the effective bandwidth is 6.25 kilohertz. Compare that to DMR, um, you have two users in 12.5 kilohertz, Again, effective bandwidth is 6.25 kilohertz, okay? So if you look at some of the other digital systems out there, um, the effective bandwidth is, is uh, equivalent, six and a quarter kilohertz. Um, that is very, very different to an analog system where historically the channels were 25 kilohertz for one user, maybe 12 and a half kilohertz. So you can see how we've compressed a lot more people into the spectrum, that is no different um, the same requirements that we had for cellular, taking the old analog original cellular systems and converting those to digital to compress things and get more people into the same um, same space, the same piece of spectrum. Now any signal can only have three components. Um, so any signal known to, known to the, anyone in the world is either going to have amplitude, frequency or phase. Um, and remember frequency and phase are um, related to each other over time. Um, but you know, if it's if it was an analog AM system, we wouldn't touch the frequency and phase, we would just change the amplitude. If it was an FM system, we would leave the amplitude fixed, the phase fixed, and we would only change the frequency. Now interestingly for Tetra, as an example, <clears throat> we actually change the amplitude and the phase. So now we've moved to two dimensions at a time, which which instantly gives us a, a two times um, improvement in, shall we say, channel efficiency or spectral efficiency. Um, you'll see better drawings than this um, when we actually look at the, the test set and the, and the um, analysis. But you'll see, you'll see in this picture on the right-hand side, there's actually four, or actually eight points. But at any one um, timing point, it, you can only be on one of four of those points. And we always, always in time, every time we, we send a symbol of data, um, or the two bits of data, we rotate by um, 45 degrees plus um, the difference depending on the data symbols. So you, you see we never stay on the same point. Um, we never go through the center. Uh, that makes it easier for the amplifiers. They don't have to be so linear in the radios. 
If they're not so linear, it means they can be made cheaper, or shall we say more cost effective. So there, there's particular reasons why, why Tetra is chosen um, with this type of modulation. Okay. Now the drawing there gives is a little bit of um, uh, a little bit inaccurate because that that is just a mathematical perfect signal with no filtering. Um, you'll see on the real signal we go beyond those points. So uh, as you go in and out from the center, you're changing amplitude, and as you go round, shall we say the the circle from the real axis, um, we're changing the phase. So so rotation is phase, and um, in and out or amplitude from the center is is the amplitude of our signal but on a real system you'll actually see we go past these points uh, those eight points you see on the outer section of the star shape um, we go beyond those um to say magnitude one points um, because of filtering um, and, and that can be quite important to check for um you know compression for example in amplifiers um, i've seen other uh, equipment, e even our Wiltec testers, they would show a drawing similar to this, um, but what you could be missing then is, is seeing any compression in those amplifiers, um, which you would see, for example, on uh, the 3920, 8800 and 3550 test sets. I'll show you the picture in a little while. Remember I said Tetra is a, is a bursted signal, a TDMA system, so time division, multiple access. So we have to we have to be quiet, not transmit until it's our time slot. And when our time slot comes, we have uh, this this T1 time to ramp up. Um, T2 is when we actually transmit the the useful data, and T3 is our time to ramp down. Uh, and those hard blue lines will be our our physical time slot. And and we have limits on on the timings. We have limits on the where the power can be in each of those three regions. Um, and it's great that we can measure all that automatically on the testers. There's many types of calls we can make on a Tetra system as well. Um, so for GSM, for example, you would only make um, a call from a GSM phone to another GSM phone or from a GSM phone to a, to a landline, to a house phone, for example, or vice versa. Um, with Tetra, there's, there's many, many different calls. Um, you know, one-to-one -one calls, um, you might do calls through the network, you might do um, uh, group calls. You can still do obviously telephone type calls to a, um, an external telephone system outside of the Tetra network. Um, the calls can be made by the, by the radio itself or the network can call the radio. Um, you might make um, emergency calls, um, all sorts of things like that. And if any of you have done an emergency call on a cell phone, you'll, you'll see Typically, it's a number of seconds to make a, to make an emergency call. Um, with Tetra, um, the, the requirement is 300 milliseconds, okay, for emergency calls. And typically, that, that is held for all other types of calls. Um, but there's many times we've seen calls take a lot more than 300 milliseconds. Um, we've actually recorded an emergency call that took 13 seconds, just under 13 seconds to make. Uh, which is unacceptable if you're in uh, an emergency situation. So looking at the 3920B, um, there are three main um, operational modes of the test set. One is um, what we call MS testing, so we're testing the, the mobile station. So that would be portables and mobiles, for example. Um, could be modems as well that are, that are on a network. So if you have, say, a water company, um, I've done work with the Panama Canal in Panama. Um, they have a lot of modems monitoring things on the canal. Could be water levels, could be water temperature. And those modems are also reporting back information on the Tetra network. Um, we have the um, Tetra BS or base station test option. Um, that's for testing the base stations, um, either, either live or in test mode. Um, we have the Tetra direct mode um, capability. So that's when the portables and the mobiles are not using infrastructure, um, but they're in effectively a walkie-talkie, you know, a local walkie-talkie mode. Um, and there's another option there, an extra option, um, energy economy mode, which I think typically only Motorola use on some of their networks, but effectively it allows us to make the radio um, go to sleep for some numbers of milliseconds or seconds, 
uh, and then wake up again to check if there's anything on the network for them. And, and that's useful if you want to conserve a little bit of extra um, you know, battery power on those portable radios. So what's so great about our testers? Um, we, uh, we've been involved with Etsy um, since it started. I think my first time with Tetra was 1993 when I was developing our Tetra signal generator um, in the Marconi days. Um, we've been members of Etsy, I think, ever since. And we wrote most of the um, test uh, documentation for the Etsy standard. So that's that's come from Viavi and its historical um, uh, companies. OK. Um, you might find other equipment that just uses a control channel. So you have a control channel which the radio will register onto the network. And then there's three three other time slots available and you can use one of those for your call. Um, we, we can allow you to do that. Or what we do, which is more typical on a real system, is we use the control channel to make the registration of the radio and command it into calls or command it into an emergency mode or command it to send a, a status message. But then for the actual um, voice traffic or data traffic, we will actually tell it to use a different channel, a, a traffic channel. So we, we test the radio in its, in its real functional mode of both control channel and traffic channel, not just using one frequency and one control channel and nothing else. Um, that can be quite important to check radio capabilities. We support all of the different Tetra caller messaging modes, um, all the call types, messaging modes, um, SDS messages, status messages, and, and if it's SDS messages, all, all the types one to four. Um, we support um, the T1 test mode and T1 RF loopback, if you have access to that, which I'll explain in more detail. Um, but we also support the Tetra TT um, registration and loopback, um, which typically is used by um, Airbus radios. Okay, whereas T1 would typically be used by um, you know, the likes of Motorola and, and some of the other players. Um, we have auto test um, only for um, mobile stations, that's only for portables and mobiles. Um, do not confuse that with auto test too, okay, which has even more capability for all systems. So auto test is, is, a, is something free you get with Tetra MS, um, but we have auto test too for all of the Tetra systems. Um, and Tetra interoperability compliant. So again, historically, we were, we were always the referee um, when two companies were arguing over whose fault was it that their radios didn't talk to the infrastructure. Um, so we would be the guys in the middle that would make the decision um, for Etsy. Interestingly, when you set up um, a, a Tetra MS um, system on, on the 3920B, um, there's quite a few parameters you need to set up before the radio will work. And this is partly for security of the radios um, and live networks. Um, you have to pick, um, you see on the left here, you have to pick the right um, frequency channel. So we have um, the standard channels are all in there, um, both in terms of frequency and you can have some kilohertz of offset or not. So for example, in Europe, we would use Tetra 380 plus 12.5 kilohertz for the emergency services. Whereas in the Middle East, typically it would be Tetra 380 with zero offset. And then the commercial services tend to be in the, the 410 and the 450 megahertz range. 800 megahertz systems for Asia Pacific, typically. Um, we allow you to make your own systems. You can set your own channel plans up or you can default back to just frequencies, just megahertz. You don't even have to have um, um, channel settings. You can just use good old megahertz. Um, on the right hand side, we have to set up the country code, network code, base color code. Um, that, that's important along with that channel plan or frequencies because without any of those being set correctly, the radio will never register on, on the base station. And it's seeing the base station as a, as a live network. Okay, so same as a live network, if your radio um, doesn't, doesn't see its, its network that it's programmed for, it will never register. Okay. 
And there's some other parameters on the right hand side, which I'll, I'll touch on one of those a little bit later. Okay. So tetratransmitter tests, um, we might want to look at frequency error. We might want to look at, at the transmitted like or slot power. Um, you might want to look at the power steps. Um, you might want to look at the, the uh, digital timing error in the system because it's got uh, timing. And you might want to look at the EVM, you know, peak and RMS. Now, we have a lot of capabilities. So the little picture you see um, to the center left, that shows you some of the capabilities we have for um, measuring the modulation accuracy. So the first three measurements, vector phase and magnitude, we'll do that over time. Um, trajectory shows the the um, um, the eight points, but all of the uh, frequency and amplitude uh, phase movement in between. Constellation would only show the eight points at the, at when we're taking the timing measurement to get the correct decode for the ones and zeros. Um, but what I'm showing on the right hand side is something called rotated vector. So this is something we, we introduced many years ago. Um, and it's very, very useful for both engineering and service um, personnel. Because what we do, we actually take the constellation points. Um, so you physically only have one in four points active at any one time. But on the screen, you would see all eight points. So the computer can, can work out which point we're at. But for humans, it's too quick. We just see all eight points. And what we do for rotated vector, we actually, we actually mathematically map them, rotate them onto one point. And that allows us to see some key issues with the radio um, graphically, as well as to the left of that picture, you see all of the numerical measurements. Okay, And that's just a sample of some of the numerical measurements we can make, and we can color code them. Everything's green, everything's passing. We would probably have a good radio, at least on the transmitter side. Now, above that picture on the right, you'll see something in red. Okay, um, If I see a screenshot like this, the first thing that goes in my head is they're doing the measurements wrong. What are they doing wrong? Okay, um, they haven't included any cable loss compensation. So again, typically from a radio, you will have a cable from the radio, um, maybe you know 50 centimeters or one meter if it's um, a portable or mobile connected to the test set. It may be five meters if you're connected to a base station. Um, and it's important that you add that cable loss into the measurements because if you don't, um, if you're transmitting one watt of power plus 30 dBm, we will measure that maybe as, as plus 28 dBm. Okay, so you could fail the power measurement or you could tune the radio and assume the test set is perfect, set it for 30 dBm, but you're actually pushing 32 dBm out of the radio. So instead of one watt, the radio is now pushing you know one and one and a half to maybe two watts of power. Um, which could break your license agreement and it could also um, uh, reduce your battery life and talk time. On the receive side, it, the same, if we put a level out of the generator, um, here I'm showing minus 80, with no cable compensation, if again, if I lose two dBs, my receiver would see minus 82 dBm. No problem at those power levels, but it does become a problem when we get to receiver sensitivity. So again, you could fail a bad, sorry, you could fail a good radio on sensitivity because you did not include the cable loss. Okay. So let's jump on. So the picture on the right, just to show you that some of the different call groups, uh, call types we can make, and you can define your own call types as well. Okay. Um, I tend to use a phone call when I'm doing when I'm doing calls because. Um, the different call types, really, you're testing different, shall we say, software features in the radio. And there'll be some guys at, at you know, Airbus, Motorola, um, Leonardo, um, you know, whoever's making these radios. Uh, there'll, there'll be people in engineering that have spent millions of, of dollars, millions of euros checking that software. Um, so normally i would i normally do just one call type i use a phone call because once it's in the call i don't have to keep pressing the push to talk button okay you might want to try an emergency call if you do that do it from the test set to the radio um 
I always warn people uh, to be very cautious, very careful if you try to make an emergency call from the radio to the test set. Um, I've seen numerous cases where um, we've had uh, a radio connected to the test set, but the base station is close by and the radio jumps off to the real network because it is much stronger. Uh, the user doesn't see that, they press the emergency button and you can have a major incident. So um, I, was in, um, I was in an oil refinery in the Middle East some years ago and we were doing this and the user, one of the users pushed the emergency button and I, I immediately knew what had happened because the test set wasn't doing anything and the refinery went into lockdown. So high security lockdown, it did not reopen until they found the cause, which was us, um, and they cleared that and it went to the, the senior management at the refinery to, to authorize the reopening. So you can imagine um, the cost to a, to a chemical facility, you know, a, a military base, um, a police headquarters, anywhere, if, if you press that emergency button and it goes live on the network. So be very careful with emergency calls. Um, I've embedded some videos in here. I will run a couple of them and jump through them. So when you download the presentation um, later, um, or if you want the presentation, you will get the video, but if you want the presentation, um, the videos are embedded inside that. So I'm, I'm gonna jump over some of this, okay? But I'm basically um, making a call um, I can use talk back, test tone and silence. So if I talk into the radio, go, hello, this is Barry in the earpiece. A few seconds later, I hear, hello, this is Barry. So I can hear the voice come back um, or I can do a one kilohertz tone. So I hear, or I can just have silence. I can change my measurements. Um, I can change statistics on those measurements um, and I can reset them back to Etsy default limits. Um, both um, normal limits and extreme limits. Okay, so there's two definitions in Etsy. Um, here you can see I'm looking at um, transmitter measurements on the left, I'm looking at the power ramps on the right. Um, now I'm looking at the whole power profile on the left. So the ramps are just those little bits at the start and the end. Um, now I'm looking at the, the vector signal. You see we don't go through the center. As I said, that makes the amplifiers a little bit cheaper to produce. Okay. okay, I can look at what's been happening with the test set all the way since I first powered up the test set and registered the radio. So as you go down this, it's registered. I've been making different types of calls. Okay, um, it tells me uh, the parameters of those calls. You saw I was in talkback, I went to the one kilohertz test tone, back to silence, etc. So everything is recorded um, and, and you can extract that or export it from the test set. Okay. So if we talk about um, the transmitter measurements, um, I've shown you a, a quick video there, I've shown you a slightly different picture here um, which I'll touch on in a moment, but the measurements are broadly similar, um, whether the radios are, are portables or mobiles in, in what we call MS mode or trunked mode, whether they're portables or mobiles in direct mode, walkie-talkie mode, or whether they're base stations, okay? Um, either off-air or even in test mode, you, you will get similar type measurements or, or, or similar looking profiles. Now, interestingly, what you see on the right on the power profile, you see, um, if you look at the, the graphic on the right-hand side, the profile ramps, um, I'm not sure if my mouse is showing up, but you see a big spike and it drops down again, then it ramps up very close to this line, which is the limit. And then this will be the useful part of the burst. And in this picture, because I'm only showing the ramps, I've chopped out most of the useful part. And then the ramp down is very quick, um, right on that timing limit edge there and drops down. Um, and the spike you see at the start, that is that is because there's like an RF kill or an RF on off. So we turn the RF on and then and then when it ramps up close to the edge, that's typically these days actually profiled in, in the software. So in the DSP software that controls the, the power level, that is actually software programmable. 
So this manufacturer, um, and many of you probably know who this is, I could I could see this picture and tell you straight away what radio it was, even if, if you didn't show me the radio. Um, that that's that's a feature of how they do their radios, and the reason they ramp up very close to those those inner edge limits is is to try and conserve an extra few percent of battery. An extra few percent of battery is extra talk time. That could translate into you know 30 minutes of extra talk time from the battery. You know that that can be very useful. For example, if you're a police officer or paramedic and you're using the radio for you know eight to 12 hours. What you see on the left-hand side, that rotated vector now is very different to what I showed you earlier. It's it's sort of in the middle of the circle, but it, it has like a little tail that goes down towards the left-hand side. Oops. Um, and again, that's a feature that, that relates to that power ramping that you see on the right. So again, the graphical pictures are quite good to see features, um, but you'll always drop back to the actual physical numbers uh, and if they're green or red or blue, um, to see if the radio is passing or failing. Okay. Another thing we might want to check is is the power control on the radio. So um, the radio just doesn't transmit full power all the time. It 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 would in direct mode, in walkie-talkie mode, which quite often is a fallback method if the network is down in an emergency situation. Um, some people purely use the radios in direct mode, in walkie-talkie mode. They have no infrastructure. But if you do have infrastructure, typically what happens is um, when you register on the network, you are, one of the parameters you get sent by the network, if you see over here, is what's called the access parameter. And here it's set as minus 45. Okay. So the radio will then transmit back based on that access parameter the network has given it. and what is what the radio's receiver is is measuring in terms of the RSSI or its received power. So as you move away from the base station, the RSSI becomes a more negative number. So in fact, the TX power would ramp up. Okay. So the lower limit of that transmit power is plus 15 dBm. It doesn't go lower than that. And the maximum is whatever the radio can do. Or what will take priority over that is the maximum TX level. Again, that is a parameter down here that the network will tell the radio when it registers. So by default, we set that to one watt. So even if you had a 1.8 watt portable or a 10 watt mobile on this network, on my base station, which it sees as a live network, the radio should never transmit more than one watt because that's the command that I've given it. So now we're bounded in this case by plus 15 dBm as a minimum and plus 30 dBm as a maximum, okay? And we always jump in five dB steps. So power control is quite an important issue because it's, again, it's all related to, to um, battery life and talk time. So that's quite important, okay? And it's, it's what's called mobile-assisted power control, okay? Some networks will command the power for the radio, um, but typically on the Tetris systems, the radio will make the decision on what it will transmit back. We can support both modes. I talked about the rotated vector and how we how we take those constellation points and we mathematically map them onto one point. Um, remember, as we go in and out, it's amplitude. As we go around the circle or the arc, um, it's phase. And here's three examples. So um, the first one, which looked a bit like the the screenshot you saw on the on the radio, where it ramped very close to the edges on on the time slot, um, that can be related to burst timing. Um, the second one in the middle, you see sort of four, four distinct points in, inside the red dotted circle, and then some other points that, that seem to be going around the, the edge of the, the arc or the circle, which is phase. Okay. And then on the right hand side, you see uh, four, little, four little lines almost um, close to the center point of that green circle. Um, so that's that's carrier leak with a little bit of phase noise. Okay. Bear in mind the green circle is actually the test limit. So so all these radios are good, but what you're starting to see here are features of the radio. Okay. And carrier leak, for example, could be could be um, uh, poor design is probably the wrong word, but it could be um, tracks on the circuit board that are close together that are cross-coupling signals, or 
quite often what carry leak becomes is um, poor screening. So if you have metal cans to screen different parts of the RF circuit, if the screening is not very good or there's some corrosion uh, on the screening interface to the board, um, or there, there's holes in the screening can to, to let out the heat, um, that can all lead to carrier leaks, so unmodulated carrier getting through onto the, the transmitter output. So these pictures are always very, very useful. Um, for receiver tests, okay, we can test um, base stations, mobiles and portables um, in two modes, both T1 and TT loopback. So we don't just support the T1 mode, we also support TT loopback. Um, the difference being with T1, you actually put a test signal into the receiver and the radio or a computer on the back end of the radio will measure the bit error rate. With TT loopback, the radio basically places a call with us and we send it um, a, a known data stream. It loops that back to us and then we recover the data stream and we measure the bit error rate on the test set. Uh, and we can also do direct mode testing. For the, for the MST1 testing, we support all of the um, Tetra T1 test modes. So we say in terms of the different test signals, but typically people will use a type one, which is a, what's called a 7.2 kilobit traffic channel. Well, that's what it's emulating. Okay. Um, if the radio supports T1 loopback, we can, we can support that. In which case we could do the, uh, the, the bit error rate measurements for you, you see on this picture here. Um, most radios don't do that. Most radios you need manufacturer software um, to be able to do the T1 measurement. And importantly, most customers do not have access to that software. Okay. And in some cases, the manufacturer's own service workshops do not have access to that software. So therein can lie a problem when you want to do receiver measurements. Okay, so you can either put, get the bit error rate measurement on the screen on the radio. Um, I don't see that very often with Tetra. You use the manufacturer software. And when I talk about tuner software, I'm not talking about software that's available to the customer base. I'm talking about um, very tightly controlled software that's only allowed to be with engineering or high level um, OEM service centers. Um, you may have engineering software, and in the case I have, I have engineering software from the manufacturers, um, which they they don't release to anyone else. Um, in fact, one of the big companies, I don't think they've even released it to any of our competitors. So we're in quite a privileged position. So this is an example of, of one of those manufacturer softwares that I have. So I can measure um, both receiver or RSSI receive signal strength and the bit error rate. Okay, as well as other parameters. It becomes a problem for most customers though, if you don't have access to it. For TT loopback, um, this is um, typically used for Airbus. If you go back in history, originally it was Nokia, then went, um, you know, EADS, Cassidian, Airbus. Um, and TT loopback method is effectively the same method that was used with GSM and 3G. So that's why Nokia implemented it. Unfortunately, um, it's only an optional um, method in the standard. T1 is mandatory. TT loopback is optional. So only Airbus have implemented it, I believe. Um, but in fact, for us as users, the test sets, it is a much preferred method because we do now have the capability to do the measurements. Okay, and they, they would come up on the right hand side here once we have the radio in um, TT loopback mode. Okay, so for example, you would key when the radio starts, star hash 5667 hash. I don't think that's secret. Um, that's actually the 5667 translates to loop for loopback. And on the test set, once the radio registers, you must press this test mode confirm button within 30 seconds. Otherwise, the radio will fall back into normal operational mode for security reasons. Okay, so radio receives the decoded data and at sensitivity level, that may decode that with some errors. It will transmit all of that back to us at high power. Um, so we don't, don't add any errors to that and we would then present that on the receiver measurement screen. Okay. For base station 
receiver measurements. Um, so now we're in the Tetra BS T1 mode. Um, again, we support all of the um, uh, Etsy standard um, payloads, shall we say test payloads. And again, just like for, for mobiles and portables, we used a T1 type one. For base stations, that's equivalent is a T1 type seven. Again, it's emulating a 7.2 kilobit traffic channel, but we do support the other, the other payloads as well. Okay, so typically, I think most, if not all the manufacturers are using the T1 type seven, um, but again, the radio receiver, so not us, usually it's the um, base station receiver that's measuring the bit error rate. Okay? And again, we'll use manufacturer software for that. Now, importantly for the base stations, we also need synchronization. Okay, so we do we have off air or what we call auto synchronization, which the likes of Airbus, you know, Leonardo, we could put in there. Um, we could add, um, you know, Dam, Hytera, Teltronic, um, those type of people. Or the other method is to use um, a pulse sync. Um, method of synchronization, for example, my troller. So here the base radio will, uh, on the service cable, provides us with a with a BNC connector that, that gives us a pulse every tetra multi-frame, every 1.02 seconds. Okay, there's an example of the measurements you'll see on the, the computer connected to the base station. Okay, um, for direct mode, um, again, you can do something with the radio, but guess what? It's the same receiver as you have in, in the um, MS or trunked mode. So the receiver is the same. We've just changed how the software works. So the, the bit error rate should be identical. Um, but just like in the mobile mode, if you, if you place a call in direct mode, you can actually use the one kilohertz test tone. And as that breaks up, so you're at minus 80 dBm, you maybe you hear it's one kilohertz, but at minus 112 dBm or minus 115, you hear and you hear it breaking up and that's that's an approximation of the um, uh, radio sensitivity not exact you need to measure bit error rate but it's a good approximation um, you can also use messaging text messaging or status messages you keep lowering the level you keep sending messages and once a radio fails to receive the messages you've hit you've hit sensitivity okay um, just to touch on the base station testing for a moment, um, I, I've picked on Motorola because I actually have a, have a Motorola base station at home at the moment. Um, base stations are much harder to carry around than portables and mobiles. Um, typically, we'll do a direct connection to the, to the base station. Um, for Motorola, we would use the pulse sync. Okay, um, but something to consider. Okay, so. Um, the test sets have a maximum power input. Um, so 125 watts for, for a period of time or 50 watts continuous. The 3550R, the portable unit, is 20 watts continuous. So now you have to be careful. If you have a base station with one radio and it transmits 40 watts, um, you can damage, for example, the 3550R. So you need a power attenuator um, before you, you put the signal into the test set. But even if you have a, a 3920B, you go, well, it's 40 watts. I'm testing a radio with 40 watts. No problem, it can handle 125 watts. Be careful. Um, you know, if you have an MTS-4, which has four base radios, if three are left in operational mode and you put one into service mode and they all come out of a single TX port, um, you, you've now got four times 40 watts, which is 160 watts. Okay, so if you're going to do this, be careful. You may need to use a power attenuator or you may need to unplug the power from the other three base radios just to make sure um, you stay within the safe power limit. And even when you've got a 40 watt, single 40 watt radio, Tetra, as I said, the, the amplitude goes above a, a nominal magnitude of one. So you don't see this in some other test sets that just show the, the graphical um, um, shall we say, constellation diagram or vector diagram with straight lines. We physically show you the, the trajectory. We show you it, and it will overshoot the points and come back because of filtering, um, which is which is to be expected. 
Um, but Tetra can have a 3.2 dB crest factor. Well, 3 dBs is double the power. So your 40 watt average output now becomes 84 watts peak. Okay. So imagine if you had four base radios running at 40 watts each, average power, potentially you could see 336 watts peak. Okay. So just spare that in mind when you're testing base stations. Um, think about the crest factor and the peak power. Think about multiple base radios all coming to that transmitter port. Okay. Um, so always think about having a power attenuator with you um, if you're testing base stations. We have auto test capability, like I said, for Tetra MS. Um, it's, it's quite a simple thing. It was ported over from the old Marconi 2968. Um, only works in MS, nothing else. Uh, but we also have auto test two, which is much more powerful. Now I'm going to jump quickly through the video, but you can see here, we've basically done a lot of measurements ourselves. Um, all you have to do is key the radio, or answer the call, and that's it. And then we take control, we can move traffic channel, we can change power levels, we can do all those measurements. Okay. Um, auto test two has a lot more capability. So for example, with, um, I'm going to again jump through here. Here we're actually reading the, the serial number and model number out of the radio and its capabilities, what software it has inside. We're doing measurements. Okay. Um, look how long that took. This is a, a Motorola MTP850 radio. Uh, and by the way, this can be fully encrypted and we can still test it. Why? Because we're using manufacturer's engineering commands. We are not using service commands. And we have equivalents for, um, for example, Airbus and Motorola Tetra base stations. And again, this is a this is a, an MTS base station, just one base radio. So if you have four, you have to do this four times. But look at that, two and a half minutes. And that's test three three transmit power levels and one receiver. I could test all three receiver paths as well if I wanted to. So three transmit power levels and three and one receiver, but at three different power levels, all in two and a half minutes. Okay. So you see here, it says Cassidian on my test set, I need to get that updated, but Airbus as well, we have TB3, TB2, for example. Um, but I will jump through this just to finish up. Um, just touching on the 8800SX 3550R and, and this, does go back as well to the, the original 8800 model, 8800S, and the plain 3550s. Um, you have some limitations. So they they will both support Tetra base station T1 mode, um, but they don't support Tetra MS or Tetra direct, direct mode. Um, 8800 has uh, auto test capability, but um, not for the Tetra radios at this time. 3550 does not have any auto test capability. Okay, just like the 3920, we can use it for drive testing. We can use these for um, indoor measurements as well with the TRX Neon software. Um, we can support both pulse sync and auto sync modes, um, but we only have the T1 Type 7 uh, test signal. Okay, unlike the 3920, which supports all the Etsy test signals, we only have the one that is the one that 99% of the people are using anyway. Okay. So with this video, I'm actually on the left, I'm actually typing commands from a computer into the base station. Um, here's my receiver measurements. Okay. Um, and you'll see now I've put minus 118 dBm into the, into the base radio. Whoops, apologies. And you'll see here it's actually red minus 118 dBm, and I've got 1.5% bit error rate. Okay, at high level minus 76 dBm, I've got 0% bit error rate. Okay, some other videos I'm not going to go into now, um, but just to summarise, the 3920 performs Etsy compliant Tetra measurements, as really do the other two test sets. Um, for, for base station um, T1 mode. Okay. We have auto test, auto test two capability and, and Tetra radios are supported. 
um, on those products. Um, for auto test, I'm happy to give you, if you want, a, a test script that I originally did for a Sapura radio that you can very easily use for any other radio. Okay. Um, the, the automated uh, portables, we've only got the MTP850 uh, in series. Um, I personally would like to add the newer Motorola radios and other manufacturer radios. And for that, we need you as the customers to push back onto those manufacturers. Say, so guys, come on, we, we need we need these guys at Viavi to do this for, for us. Okay, push back on the manufacturers so they work with us. We do this with all of the other standards, your DMR, P25, NXDN, for example. Um, fully automated base station testing or, or commissioning tests. So you don't need the, the engineer's computer. We do that for you. We become the computer. We control the base station as well as a test set. Um, and you could write your own your own tests using um, the Ethernet remote control on any of the test sets. And a final note there, do not forget to include the cable loss in the RF measurements. That will be your biggest problem otherwise. Okay. So thank you. I'll throw it back to Francesco now if we have any, any uh, <coughs> questions. Uh, um, hi. Barry, thank you very much for your presentation, very in-depth presentation. Yes, we have several questions. They started to come in from uh, the beginning of the of your talk. Uh, I can pull some of them. Uh, one is, uh, for example, please advise how to detect Tetra base station and uh, MS, bad synchronization issues, decreasing coverage radium, especially when Tetra base station synchronization is uh, switched from E1 to IP synchronization by NTP mm -hmm. or PTP protocols? Okay, so um, the easiest way to check the timing, I, I know you know most people use GPS, or should I say GNSS systems, um, for timing synchronization, synchronization on their Tetra base stations and Tetra networks. The, the main, ex, the main, the main um, country that doesn't do that is China. Okay. They took the decision, we don't trust the American GPS system, therefore we'll use network timing. As network timing's improved, um, I mean IP network timing, Ethernet timing, um, as that has improved, more people will use that going forward because of the issues with, with GPS spoofing and jamming. Um, oh, sorry, GNSS, I shouldn't just, just limit it to the US system. Uh, it could be any system that's spoofed or jammed. Um, so a lot more people will, will start using um, IP network timing. Um, or they use that now anyway as a fallback method. So if the GPS failed or GNSS failed, um, they would drop back to network time anyway. Um, you can actually check that to, to some level with the test set because in the test set, we, we run off a 10 megahertz oven controlled reference, which is usually pretty good. Not as good as a GNSS system, but pretty good. Um, what you can do then off air is you can sniff a base station, a channel, and when you decode it, you will get the frequency error. So that frequency error, um, typically if it's out by say eight hertz, that's actually the error in our OCXO, our 10 megahertz OCXO translated up to whatever, 380 megahertz. So if you take a 10 hertz error, divide it by 38, that's the error in our 10 megahertz reference. Okay, because it's at 380 megahertz. Um, so you could actually check the timing of, of the in infrastructure by looking at the frequency error on the test set. Of course, test set to test set may change, may, may change a little bit, <clears throat> or you can even ca calibrate the test set in your lab using you know, a rubidium standard, for example. Say, so, okay, I know my test set is out by eight hertz. So if I measure a base station, it's out by eight hertz. I know the base station is perfect. If my test set says 12 hertz, I know my base station is actually off on timing a little bit. Okay, so that might be a simple method to do that. Okay, Barry, thank you for this answer. <clears throat> one easy one. <clears throat> I was like 20, you identify the radio manufacturer just by the power ramping profile. <clears throat> this person is asking if we have uh, something or a chart identifying uh, the radio 
for different, different <laughs> manufacturers. Um, they need to buy a venture in this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We have a we have a nice big system. You guys can buy a broadband system from our um, sort of sort of uh, military portfolio, shall we say? Not not purely military, commercial as well. But um, yeah, we could characterise things in there and and and, and work out you know, a lot more than we can do here with the test sets. Um, a lot of a lot of my knowledge of which which user or which radio it is, even if it was in a a, a box or you know a black bag and I didn't see it. Uh, whether it's a base station, mobile or portable, I, I'm pretty good at, at picking out some of the manufacturers now because of the characteristics of their radios. Um, however, you could have another manufacturer's radio that has um, slightly poorer performance than they would normally have, and, and that could then look like one of those other manufacturers who have done it deliberately, you know, to save a little bit of battery power or to to increase talk time or um, to try and improve something else. So it, it's quite interesting now in the, in, the, in the good old days of radios 20 years ago, you know, most things you, you turn a little screw and you, you, you tune things up that way. Now it's all done with, with software defined radios and, and uh, DSPs. So like I said, even the ramp profiling um, is, is generally software controlled these days in the radios. So yeah, I, I can see some of the features on radios and I, I can very quickly tell you Whose base station or whose portable or mobile it is, um, but we do have we do have other systems that will do that in a much better, efficient way for you. Um, so if anyone if anyone here is from the military or government or the bigger commercial organisations, they might be interested in that. Yeah, in this case, just uh, ping to us, and then we'll be able to respond to you, to you directly. Mm -hmm. um, one more question. Uh, can a 3920B work with any Tedra radio or base uh, station? What if it is encrypted? Okay, so um, yes, it will work with any uh, mobile, portable or base station, at, at least as far as I know. And I've been working with this test set for over 15 years now and previous to that with the Marconi test set and the Wiltec testers. Um, with encryption, no, we don't have encryption on the test sets. Um, interestingly, for P25, for example, we do have encryption capabilities, both both AES and DES. Some of that is export controlled out of the US. For Tetra, there is no encryption capability. Um, and it's a decision we made many, many years ago at the start because some countries, uh, knowing that the initial market was all public safety, not commercial initially, um, some countries, um, and some of them quite influential around the world, said that if uh, if there was encryption capability on the Tetra system, then um, the product would either be export controlled or um, would be blacklisted in that country. And, and multiple countries were telling us this. So we took the decision not to include encryption. So a couple of ways around that, you, you have a clear channel on the radio um, that's programmed in and, and just left there that, that users don't normally see or use, but we have access to it. Um, that does leave you with a potential security hole. Um, that's been recognized over here, for example, with GCHQ in the UK. That would be a security risk on, on the emergency services network. Potential risk. There's lots of other risks. Um, you could have um, a fallback mode enabled. So if there are no encrypted channels available on your network, it will automatically fall back to unencrypted. Uh, again, that's a security risk, but it's it's good for us. I've actually seen that in a Middle East network where uh, police were talking and uh, it was unencrypted. Um, now it was Arabic, so to me it was encryption. I don't understand Arabic, but it was plain voice Arabic. So when the, when the customer found out, um, they got very upset. I found the problem for them and, and they went to their supplier um, a group of them went to the supplier very quickly um, and demanded this was fixed. Um, and the third way you do it is you you have to reprogram the radio. So that's the least preferred method. Okay, but encryption is always is always a, an issue with with national security um, and and leaving a a method open for someone to attack your network. So it is quite a um, a hot topic, especially with cybersecurity these days. Okay, Barry, thank you very much. I believe that uh, 
we have used uh, five minutes more than our time. I believe that it's time to stop. We will respond to all your questions directly uh, with separate emails. We will contact you and then uh, we are going to send you the registration, the link of registration of this presentation within 48 hours, roughly. This will be the, the average. I would like to thank you, everybody, and uh, we would like to see you next time to the next session. Bert, do you want to say the last word? Uh, just thank you, everyone, for, for listening to me once again. Um, I hope you enjoy the webinars. Uh, apologies, it seems to always be me doing them in EMEA, but um, I, I do have a good broad depth of knowledge on both these, these public safety type systems and commercial systems and also the military systems. So at least if you have some in-depth questions, I'm, I'm probably the right guy to answer them. So again, thank you very much for attending and we hope to see you at the next webinar. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.